Good morning and welcome delegates. We are so excited to have you all here for this year's Boise Model United Nations Conference. And I look forward to a weekend of diplomacy, critical thinking, collaboration, and problem solving. My name is Sophia Carlson, and I have had the honor of working with several of my Model UN peers to organize, prepare, and now run this year's Boimon Conference. We are excited to announce that we have over 35 delegates representing five schools from the Great Northwest. While Boimon is a small regional conference, we are excited to welcome the delegates from Evergreen Middle School in Everett, Washington, as well as the delegates from Community School in Sun Valley, Idaho. And to our Boise delegates from Riverstone International School, Sage International School, and One Stone's Lab 51, welcome. Thank you all for participating in this year's student-led Boise Model UN Conference and for believing in the power of students. I have found Model UN to be an amazing way to gain a deep understanding about relevant international topics. It has helped me become informed and knowledgeable about the world around me. It has been an excellent way to develop empathy for a diversity of worldviews and to gain a richer understanding about some of the problems the world faces today. When debating from a position that is very different from my own, my eyes are opened to the concerns of other countries and I am able to gain a deeper understanding about why there's conflict in the world and how diplomacy can be a powerful tool to overcome differences and solve complex global issues. At this year's Boimon Conference, I will have the honor of chairing the World Health Organization Committee. I'm super excited to work with the delegates of the WHO Committee to discuss, debate, and resolve the issues surrounding the ever important topics of pandemic preparedness and, and the mental health of refugees. The issues surrounding these topics are quite relevant and visible in the world today. We are all experiencing firsthand the effects of being unprepared for the emergence of a pandemic. We have seen hospitals reaching capacity, suicide rates and domestic violence increasing. Being prepared for a pandemic is more than having a full supply of PPE. Delegates of the WHO, I challenge you this weekend to consider all impacts a pandemic can bring. Through researching and debating this, this issue, I hope we can come to a greater understanding of why the COVID-19 pandemic has hit so hard and what we can do to better prepare for future pandemics. The topic of refugee mental health is also very important. According to the UN Refugee Agency, one person becomes displaced every three seconds. That's right, every three seconds. Delegates, that is a very significant number. In the course of this brief speech, that would be over 100 people displaced. Stress from displacement and immigration has led many refugees to need mental health assistance, but they often don't have access to the resources they need. Not being able to get the support they need in this area can be extremely detrimental to their livelihood and their families. I look forward to helping this year's WHO committee engage in a deep discussion into these issues, and not only to come up with creative and realistic solutions, but also to become more understanding of the challenges that we as an entire world face. I hope that this conference can inspire some of you to keep informed about and one day possibly help to tackle current world issues. I will now hand it over to my fellow Deputy Secretary General, Ryan Ruman. Good morning, delegates. My name is Ryan Ruman. I will be co-chairing the Commission on the Status of Women. This is my third year working with the Mali United Nations and I have loved every conference, every committee, and every team meeting of my career. Mali United Nations has served as a powerful outlet for me to learn about diverse perspectives regarding topics I'm passionate about and interested in, as well as taking on topics that have been entirely new to me or not as familiar with. Mali UN has afforded me an amazing opportunity to practice public speaking skills and learn more about the intricacies of diplomacy and debate. After three years working hard as a delegate, I'm honored to have had the privilege to help organize and design this year's Boise Mali UN Conference and to co-chair the Commission on the Status of Women. The CSW is a committee focused on women's rights and empowerment. The topics we have selected for this conference are important and sensitive. They are domestic violence against women and female genital mutilation and reproductive health care rights. I look forward to this year's committee to dive deep into exploring the actions we must take to ensure the global safety of women. How to incorporate education systems into our solutions and explore what measures should be taken to prevent hu future human rights violations involving women. Delegates of the CSW committee, I am honored to serve as your co-chair and look forward to working with you this weekend. I will now pass the microphone to my fellow co-chair and Deputy Secretary General, Carissa Van Winkle. Hello, delegates. 
My name is Krista Van Winkle, and I'll be co-chairing the Commission on the Status of Women with Ryan. This is my second year being involved in Model United Nations, and I have learned so much. A big part of the reason I'm passionate about MUN is that it connects me to and informs me about areas of the world that aren't focused on in the mainstream media and are seldom talked about in school. MUN allows me to understand and connect to the issues and struggles that people of those areas face and widens my scope of the news from the US to the entire world. I'm excited to facilitate this weekend's committee, the Commission on the Status of Women, as I find both the topics of domestic violence against women and the issue of female genital mutilation and reproductive health care rights to be very important issues in today's world. On a personal level, I feel the issue of domestic violence against women is not talked about enough and is sometimes treated as a taboo subject to discuss. However, because we are now in a time where we are seeing cases of domestic violence against women on the rise due to the stresses and challenges presented by our current global health crisis, COVID, it is more important than ever for us to learn about issues surrounding domestic violence and intimate partner violence. I hope through the debate and discussion this weekend, we all learn more about the resources available for women experiencing domestic violence and feel confident in informing others on the topic. Regarding our second topic on reproductive health care rights and the issue of female genital mutilation, I feel this is also not talked about enough. Though FGM is a cultural practice not seen as often today, it still greatly affects those that are forced to experience it because of religious or cultural norms. I feel it is important that we not leave these people and their struggles behind. This committee will allow us all to learn more about these issues and spread awareness on them. I'm super excited for debate and to hear y'all's research positions and proposed solutions for these challenges. Now that you've gotten to know each member of the Boymon team, we are excited to introduce this year's keynote speaker, Dr. Dan Prinzing. Dr. Dan Prinzing is the executive director of the Wasmuth Center for Human Rights, the builder of and home of the Idaho Ann Frank Human Rights Memorial. The center's mission is to promote respect for human dignity and diversity through education and to foster individual responsibility to work for peace and justice. The site is the only Anne Frank Memorial in the United States and is one of just a few places in the world where the entire text of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is on permanent public display. Prior to joining the Wasmuth Center for Human Rights in 2007, Dr. Prinzing was the Idaho State Department of Education's coordinator of civic and international education, the former SDE coordinator of social studies and curricular materials, and a language arts and history teacher in Boise School District. Today, Dr. Prinzing is a leader in the Boise community. He has helped our community navigate the challenging waters we have faced in regards to social justice and human rights. Dr. Prinzing is a fierce champion of the ideals of equity, equality, and justice. Dr. Prinzing is an educator, a community leader, and an amazing human being. While Dr. Prinzing was unable to attend this morning's opening ceremony, as he works on the weekends too, he was gracious enough to pre-record his speech, which we are honored to share with you now. The Wasma Center for Human Rights is the builder and home of the Idaho and Frank Human Rights Memorial. Recognized as an international site of conscience, the memorial is one of the few places in the world in which the full text of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is on public display. That document is the source of inspiration for a new sculpture that will be added to the memorial in 2022. The piece, titled Uplifted, features a span of wings with words integrated into the design that are drawn from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What words do you associate with human rights? Does your list include any of the following? Dignity, freedom, education, justice, Equality, peace, conscience, recognition, security, 
respect, protection, aspiration, agreement, expression, tolerance, reason, friendship, understanding, safety, liberty, or hope. Those were the words submitted to the artist of Uplifted by members of our Memorial Docent Committee. I wonder what words you might have submitted to him. For our purposes today, I would like to add a word of my choice, community. The seventh Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan stated, human rights education is much more than a lesson in schools or a theme for a day. It is a process to equip people with the tools they need to live lives of security and dignity. Let us continue to work together to develop and nurture in future generations a culture of human rights, to promote freedom, security, and peace in all nations. The quote recognizes that when we are talking about human rights, we are talking about people, real lives, not abstract concepts. When I'm asked about the work of the WASMA Center, I often reference that we give a face and a voice to the other, the other faith, the other culture, the other ethnicity, the other race, the other sexual orientation, the other who also lives within the fabric of our community. The other is an individual who is perceived by the group as not belonging as being different in some fundamental way. Any stranger becomes the other. The group sees itself as the norm and judges those who do not meet that norm, that is, they're different in some way, as the other. Perceived as lacking essential characteristics possessed by the group, the other is almost always seen as lesser or inferior and is treated accordingly. The other in a society may have few or no legal rights, may be characterized as less intelligent or as immoral, and may be even regarded as subhuman. Let's travel around the world with some of the center's international work. I was working in the Republic of Ireland in Northern Ireland, conducting a series of interviews with students to evaluate the impact of a program model we had piloted that school year. In several of the interviews, the students talked about identifying community issues or problems that were not necessarily a problem for themselves, but were in fact a problem for others in the community. As one young man told me, I am tackling this problem for them because right now they do not have a voice. One day I might need them to speak for me. He spoke so compassionately about his need to help the other. For three years, I managed a technology project in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. During those years, I traveled to Jordan five or six times a year. Each trip, one of the Jordanians who was working on the project would insist that I experience something, eat something, or see something that would help me to understand Arab culture, the Islamic faith, or Bedouin tradition. On one visit, he took me into the oldest section of Amman to go to the public bath, an ancient, hot and steamy vault in which during segregated hours, men and women gathered from throughout the city. There was a ritual to the steam room, the massage, the scrub, and the soaking pool followed by a fruit juice drink in a lounge area. My Jordanian friend noted that in the bath, all men are the same. There is no distinction in social order or wealth. It's where they gather together as a community. It was on another visit to Jordan that my friend took me to lunch to talk about the pillars of the Islamic faith. We talked about the concept of jihad. He insisted that the American media had distorted the true meaning of the word. For Muslims, 
the jihad is the personal struggle one has with his or her faith. That internal battle one has when wrestling with issues of faith and belief in a higher power. He asked if I had ever experienced jihad. The more we talked, the more we had in common. The Arab language has a word for community. It is shahama, and it translates as always ready to help people, neighbors, anybody in need, and always ready to be a support for fragile members of the community. Several years ago, I had a contract to conduct an evaluation study on the institutionalization of civic education in Thailand. For two weeks, I interviewed Thai government officials, teachers, administrators, students, and NGO representatives to gather data for the evaluation. In the course of the study, I also spent a number of days with Buddhist monks, linking Buddhist precepts to the knowledge, skills, and dispositions of civic learning. One night, I was taken to the ambassador from Myanmar's residence so that I could meet his honored guest, a revered monk who had just celebrated his 90th birthday. As is the custom and show of respect, I shuffled into the room on my knees and sat cross-legged before the monk for two hours. Most of the time he slept. So I turned and whispered with the young monk who accompanied him on his travels. When the older monk awoke, I received a blessing for what he called the important work that shaped students' lives. And I scooted back out of the room. Returning to Thailand for two other projects, I was able to meet with the young monk again. One day as we wandered through temple grounds, he turned to me, smiled and said, you know, we are very much alike. While we had discussed faith in his years of training, we found our greatest commonality. We laughed a lot. The young monk taught me that the Thai language has a word for community. Nam Jai, which literally means water of the heart. He told me that when Thai people say that a person has Nam Jai, it means that this person is happy to make sacrifices for friends and extend hospitality to others. In 2007, the center conducted a leadership program for 18 school administrators from Bolivia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. For three weeks, we delivered a series of seminars, cultural experiences, and school visits, all in Spanish. On Sundays, I took the entire delegation to the Spanish Mass at St. John's Cathedral. Of the 18, only one spoke English. The nature of a grant-funded program like this is that we are on 24-7 as hosts, ambassadors, and program specialists. What was significant in this experience is that I do not speak Spanish. But for three weeks, we did a lot of laughing and cheek kissing. And on our final night together, I toasted with Unamundo con mi amigos, one world with my friends. And we cried. It was the most gut-wrenching experience I've ever had in a hotel lobby. One of the Spanish language words for community is convivencia, and it means how to live together peacefully. Regardless of what differences we have, we can live together. For two years, we conducted a program for teachers and students in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo and Serbia. In the course of the two years, I spent several weeks in pre and newly independent Kosovo. Each visit included time with a cadre of young teachers who were new to the field of civic and human rights education. The culminating project in the program was a human rights democracy camp in Macedonia, a neutral Balkan country. Attending the camp, 120 high school students from Bosnia, Serbia, and Kosovo, as well as 90 accompanying teachers, program coordinators, and government officials. 
For one week, I taught in a classroom of 120 students. I taught in English, which was translated into Albanian, and again into Serbo-Croatian. Now you have to imagine telling a joke and the laughter ripples through the room in three distinct waves. One of the camp assignments included the writing of a poem for social justice. One student from Bosnia wrote, love is all we need. And Serbs and Kosovars and Bosnians, we all want it. We want the world based on justice, courage and love between women and men. We want the 1990s never to hurt us again. We want the world which is led by youth too. We wanna to teach you something new. We want the world where people travel 20 hours just to be together. We already made that world here and it'll last forever. When she finished reading her poem aloud, the room erupted in applause. She had captured what they all felt. On the last night of the camp, we held a dance for the participants. The students and a majority of the teachers were having a great time. But then I noticed the young teachers from Kosovo, mostly male, all Muslim, tapping their feet, but not dancing. Their faith would not allow them to dance with the female teachers. It was like a painful memory of chaperoning a junior high dance, watching the wallflowers aching to be pulled into the action. So what do you do? I went to my Albanian brotherhood and I pulled them to the dance floor and we danced and we danced and I slipped out and they continued to dance. These were my friends. The Albanian language has a word for community, humanitar, devoted to the promotion of human welfare. A training with teachers from Malawi taught me their word for community, umbutu, means that when you are on your own, you are as good as an animal of the wild. When there are two of you, you form a community. On this journey, the other has a face. Be they Arab, Jordanian, and Muslim, his name is Allah and hers is Mona. And they opened their homes and extended their hospitality in the full depth of Bedouin tradition. Thailand is a young Buddhist monk who at the age of 30, after 15 years of monk training, decided to disrobe. He was having a Buddhist jihad. Kosovo is a band of Albanian brotherhood, poor struggling teachers in a war-torn country, still marred in the memory of unspeakable incivility, but they want to dance. And the faces of South America, I see standing before the priest at St. John's, waiting to be blessed before they flew home. For me, each country, culture, or faith, all of the others have a face. They also have a word for community that seems so much richer, so much deeper than my own. Theirs is not to live in a community, but to be a community. Community. I'd like the artist to integrate that word into the design of the sculpture. If we are promoting and protecting human rights, are we in fact protecting and promoting community? I think so. And I'd like to live there. Thank you.